Rock. The Rock Pile Report. The pettiest, hardest drinking Bills podcast. Welcome, everybody, to another edition of the Rock Pile Report podcast. I'm your host, Bills season ticket holder, Drew Gear. That's my producer, Chris Krueger. And we are here talking about week two, the Buffalo Bills against the Miami Dolphins. No rest for the wicked, baby. We get right back after it, don't we? Yeah, uh, you know, speaking of the Dolphins, uh, today I changed the wax ring on my toilet. <laughs> I've never, I've never attempted that before. So, hang on. It, uh, speaking it, of the it, Dolphins, yes, yeah, I, yeah. <laughs> I changed the wax ring on my. I've never done it before. Watch a couple of y'all tube videos and then uh, <laughs> go to Home Depot, buy a wax ring and uh, do it yourself. That's exactly what I did with my uh, Monday late morning, early afternoon. Is there a reason that this was necessary? Uh, leakage. Oh, leakage over into the uh, laundry room right over there. Good luck with that. So we think it was the wax wax ring. So, so we'll are see. you still in wait and see mode? I mean, I flushed the toilet a couple times. <laughs> now there's a piece of cardboard over there. We'll see if we uh, get any drippage. Oh, my God. It's second week in a row. Chris, what if lukewarm Montucky is the key? I don't know. <laughs> what if, don't know. I wouldn't. Listen. Bruce Nolan makes a whole thing about talking about sports superstitions. And this concept that what you do can't possibly impact the universe. And so in that way, you're an idiot for believing that these little ticky tack superstitious things you do like it's stupidity. I wear the same blue pair of boxers to every Bills game. I buy a new one every year. I wear them week one. I wear them until they lose. And then I burn them and I get new ones. And the cycle starts again. I don't think our fan base wanted to know that. Well, now I've got another superstition I can add. I'm going to drink a lukewarm Montucky every preview show because it seems to work. And it's two years old, so <laughs> hopefully you don't get sick. You're going to get sick because you have an iron. You, you generally I'm have an iron stomach. I've seen that before. You've watched me eat leftovers that even you and your wife were both like, don't don't do that. Yes, I meant to I've throw that you, away earlier. I've seen you eat week old chicken wing dip. <laughs> I don't fear anything, Chris. We don't fear the Reaper, just like we don't fear the Miami Dolphins ahead of this matchup, right? Correct. Guys, week two preview, the Buffalo Bills against the Miami Dolphins. The time is 8.15 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. The place, Hard Rock Stadium, Miami, Florida. The line, the Dolphins are two and a half point favorites, less than a field goal at home. I like that. Yep. I like that. Who do we got on the call, Chris? Al Michaels and Herbie, Kirk Herb Street. What do you think about Kirk Herb Street? I like the guy. From, Good looking dude. Brings his dog into the into the box. That does make him valuable. Al Michaels, do you believe in miracles? Yes. <laughs> do you believe that he's slipping a little bit? No. No, you still think he's as good as he's always been? No. If I was Al Michaels and I had to call, was it Broncos Colts a couple of years ago? I would ha I would be that annoyed on air and I would sound that way, too, the way he was of that Thursday night game. I can remember being at Helium and coming out of the because uh, Helium does one show on Thursday nights, coming out of that show and, and seeing the game almost over. And it's like. 15 to 12 or something. It's like nothing but field goals. And then you read online that Al Michaels sounded annoyed on the call. Well, yeah, anyone would sound annoyed after having to sit there to, to call that football game. I mean, I can't argue with you. <laughs> if you told me, hey, this thing that you've made, not just a job out of, but art out of. By the way, we're going to saddle you with some elementary school horse shit, and you just have to pretend that it's interesting. I don't think I'd have it in me. I really don't. The guy did. Well, I wonder if that's how John Madden got to where he was at the end when he was. Remember when he was working with L. Michaels? Yeah, yeah. 
I'll never forget one of my favorite exchanges. L. Michaels, John Madden, Sunday Night Football. Me and my friend Neil have been hung over all day just watching football. We are literally made and split a Marie Callender's family-sized chicken pot pie. And then proceeded to go to Tops to buy more pies. We were like, everything we should eat should be pie-shaped. So we went and bought two more frozen chocolate and pumpkin pies and just ate them during Sunday Night Football because I was a fat man. And I loved every second of it. So Madden during halftime just looks at L. Michaels and goes... Well, you can kind of like he's off camera and he's kind of turning. He's like, so uh, green and what did he say? Green. Oh, no. Blue and yellow. Blue and yellow. What do those colors make when you mix them? And Al Michaels is confused. And he's like, uh, uh, green. And he goes, nope. They make brown. He goes, I know, mm-hmm. because I got mustard on my tie during the uh, half time. I was eating a hot dog and there's mustard on my tie. And when I tried to rub it out, it turned brown. And Al Michaels looked at the camera with this bleary, just like, like he couldn't believe the conversation he was involved in. Like, what? I'm, I am a savant. What am I doing here? (laughs) Having this conversation with a baboon. Yeah. And it wasn't long after that John Madden was retired slash put out to pasture. (laughs) That man has seen, he's called some of the best games. He's also seen some real war crimes, some real war crimes when it comes to sports and had to just sit there and eat all three hours of it. Yeah, yeah. I feel bad for him. The injuries to watch. So I think both teams got a little bit of good news today, right? Like we found out Josh Allen's hand injury, not going to bother him. He's a full participant. He's going to play. But we already knew that, right? At the same time. Teron Johnson immediately ruled out with an arm injury that is yet to be really, truly diagnosed. And the coach's comments don't make it sound great, right? No, about a month. That's my guess. Four weeks. Dwayne Smoot also did not participate with a toe injury. And Ty Johnson with a knee injury. I, I have to go back or ask bangedupbills.com when that happened. Javon Solomon's working back from an oblique injury. I'll be interested to see what he brings to the defensive end rotation when he's healthy enough to play. On the Miami Dolphins side of the fence, things get a little interesting. Devon A. Chan and Raheem Moster, both of their starting running backs, did not participate. But they did get good news that linebacker David Long, full participant, even though he was like, Oh, my God, he's got a hand injury. He might be in real trouble. And then a couple other guys were limited, but it's Jalen Phillips and Jalen Ramsey. And these are guys who are stars who are there just kind of putting some bubble wrap on ahead of this. Chris, it's Dolphins week. It's Dolphins week, and it comes so early this year. And it's hard to really know what that means for either team. Like when you think about what. Our season is going to be what – I mean, all we have is the rivalry, right? Yeah, yeah. Neither one of us really knows what type of football team we are. I like that we get Miami in the first two to three weeks of every single season. Last week, I think it was week four, right? Yeah, yeah. We get them out of the way in the first quarter because we – like, we don't play the Patriots for the first time until, what, November? No, Yeah, October, November. So, I mean – Well, it should be a – it should be a NFL law that Buffalo has to go to Miami early and Miami's got to come here in like December or January. We're Guys, I, I'm sorry. Chris is literally playing the body cam footage of Tyreek Hill getting arrested right now. They had to know they're going to be in trouble, right? I Sure. <laughs> Those cops have to know they're going to be in trouble for that. You think there wasn't one of them that was like, ah, shit, we might have been. Maybe this has gone too far. Yeah, well, we got to just get the whole story out. That's that's it. That's it. Uh, Guys, it's it's weird when we when you think about where both teams are after week one. But I know who I can talk to about where we as fans are about this rivalry and about how just kind of both teams narrowly avoided disaster and got into this. We roll on into tonight's guest. And so to walk us through all of this, 
ahead of what is the Bills, you know, first big divisional test is a man who I thought he was kidding, folks, but he actually went and fucking did it. A man who is currently wearing an infuriating jersey, Mr. Elf Artiaga from Three Yards Per Carry. How you doing this afternoon, Elf? Good. <laughs> good like uh, good like uh, cheat after they unhooked him and let him play, or good as in like... <laughs> good as in when Jason Sanders kicked that ball through the uprights. <laughs> That's how good? Well, that's a good after missing After missing a chippy before that, and after... Uh, we got called for a phantom holding penalty on. Get this, Tyreek Hill does a uh, on their on our crack toss play that basically ices the game. They call holding on Tyreek Hill <laughs> on Eric Armstead. <laughs> Eric Armstead is three hundred and fifteen pounds. When you look at the play, all Tyreek is doing is throwing himself in front of Eric Armstead and <laughs> trying to impede his progress, and it's twenty yards away from the play. Of course, that erases the play to ice the game, and we end up kicking a 52-yard field goal instead of a chippy, you know, as time expires. <laughs> you know, officiating was something yesterday, and it wasn't only in our game. No, no, Bill. In fact, you know what? Bills fans can probably commiserate with you about that. The officiating was uh, suspect at best. Chris, you, you, you heard the chant. The, yeah, the, yeah. The refs you suck chant got going pretty early in our game. And you, it, it made the rounds. It kept coming back. Guys, Elf Artiaga from Three Yards Per Carry. For those of you not watching on YouTube, which I don't know why you haven't picked it up yet, you, you're you not looking at what I'm looking at. My blood pressure went up a couple points just seeing it. Elf, what do you currently have on? This is a game-used jersey from Brian Cox from 1994 that he wore against the New England Patriots and it's autographed by him right here. You see it? Yeah, Brian see Cox. It. <laughs> of all the people, the Brian Cox. I hate that guy. I hate his guts. He doesn't even know great who guy, I am. Man. Great I, guy. Great guy. I bet he's not. <laughs> I bet he's not. Very profane. Does not like Buffalo. I, and Buffalo doesn't like him. Never will. His son was here. Like... Okay, so you got to go back a couple years. The NFL season's kind of playing out, and every time they would put up Carolina on the TV, like a highlight during halftime, they'd be, you know, they put together a little, you know, the two minute package and they talk about their game and whatever. And I would find myself like audibly cussing out the Panthers. And my wife looks at me and she goes, What do you, what kind of a problem could you possibly have with the Carolina Panthers? What did they do to you? And I was like, Honestly, I don't even know. I don't know why I just see him and I'm like the hell with these guys. And then we're like five, six weeks into the season and I see a blurb about, Oh yeah, Brian Cox juniors on the roster. And I was like, there it is somewhere in my subconscious. I had, I saw it squirreled it away and was just subconsciously. Every time I saw that team's logo was like, man, screw those guys. <laughs> I'll see them, that guy and his father in hell. I found a tweet in my old drafts that I never got a chance to send. And they were talking about who's a famous person that like you have beef with that has no clue you exist. And mine was Brian Cox. And I said, if I was in an airplane that was going down and I had, there were, there was one parachute left between me and him. I would throw it out the door just so I could watch him go to hell firsthand. <laughs> like, I hate this guy because I think he and you know why, though, because Chris, right or wrong, you can have all the Marino highlight reels. You can have all of the montages of the come from behind wins that either the Bills, or the Dolphins had. But I don't think any one specific player or one specific moment defines what that era of like the Bills Dolphins rivalry was like Brian Cox. True. Like, Elf, is that a fair assessment? Of what? Like, exactly. he uh, he embodies what our rivalry at its peak was. Pretty much. <laughs> I would say so. Because it doesn't, because if you think about it, it's not really Jim Kelly or Dan Marino. No. Or, you know, any of the guys who have gone through here. Or even some of the great games or the bad ones. It doesn't really matter. It doesn't even matter what this latest incarnation it's just the visceral hatred of that 90s of uh, rivalry you know and how it played out actually 
Because if you remember, and I think we talked about this on a previous podcast, most of the wins happened in each other's place. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, Dolphins didn't really defend at that time, Joe Robbie Stadium against the Buffalo Bills. And the Bills didn't defend. Uh, I don't know what you guys called it back then. I think it was Ralph Wilson, right? Mm-hmm. So yep. the Ralph. So I don't, I don't know what, you know, what it really blew up into, but it really was just a visceral hatred of these guys keep coming in here and beating us. And there's nobody else in the division that's challenging for anything. And whoever wins this thing has the inside track. And at some point, the Dolphins didn't even have the inside track for that either because they kept losing at home to the Bills whenever they had the chance to actually ice the thing. <laughs> so, yeah, the, the 90s, that never gets any better than, than it was in those 90s. Never does. No. And it won't get better now either, you know, no. no matter how good this rivalry may become. We'll never bring that back. So for no. as much as I hate that son of a bitch's jersey that you have on, he is the embodiment of what this thing was. And at least in terms of the importance of the division, I think what it still is. Now, obviously, we're recording this on a Monday and we're doing it before Monday Night Football. It's weird thinking about the fact that the AFC East could be like one of the few divisions where every single team won a game, right? No, that's not happening tonight. <laughs> you don't think so? You don't think the Jets have it in them? No. no. Leonard that's Floyd has the, has a chance to do the funniest thing ever. <laughs> that's the, the most hilarious thing ever. Just rough up Aaron Rodgers real good one more time. No, I the Patriots upset, right? Like we can call it that because the Patriots aren't supposed to beat Joe Burrow and the Cincinnati Bengals inside their building, right? Uh, you would think so, but they they were absolutely horrid. And for what, I don't know if you saw bits and pieces of that game. I do this thing every Monday where, you know, look, uh, I tell everybody I sit here every Monday and I watch the abbreviated version of every single game mm -hmm. that I missed. So I know what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm not watching that giant Minnesota game. Okay? <laughs> no, I just watched the play that Andrew Van Ginkle got an interception on, <laughs> you know, because he did it again. He got another pick six. By the way, they were saying it wrong on TV. They were saying, oh, that's the second touchdown in his career. No, that's his fourth touchdown in his career. That dude is money. That dude's the greatest thing ever. <laughs> like he just <laughs> finds the football or the football finds him. And I like his interview after the game when they asked him, you know, you know, what was your read there? And he goes, Daniel Jones threw the ball right at me. <laughs> He's like, there's nothing fancy. You know? He threw it at me. I didn't do yeah. anything. So, you know, I do this thing where I go through all the games and look, I watched the Cowboys and the Browns live and wow, Deshaun Watson is bad, man. An entire off season of getting ready to play football and you produce that. Uh, not for long. They're oh, hoping no. that he he screws up with the law somehow and they could get out from under that contract. Well, there's already you know, there's already another the another lawsuit. Yeah, no, I saw it. there's a there's a lawsuit. And you, you know what the know, Browns could do? They should trade for Baker Mayfield is what they should do. <laughs> you, you know, the Browns right now are praying someone in their front office is two hands together on his knees right now going, please let this be the thing that sinks this guy and takes him off our hands. <laughs> yeah, but you asked me about the Patriots and, and the Bengals. I watched that thing this morning, and when I tell you that the Patriots were just run, run, passing their way to just get our defense out there, and these guys are not going to do anything, <laughs> that's what they did. They <laughs> run, run, pass the entire game. <laughs> they essentially started running out the clock as soon as they got a lead. You know, uh, I thought it was awful. I thought I thought it was a terrible look for the Bengals. But I will remind our listeners and. Football fans everywhere. Week one is a notorious liar. You can't learn a thing from week one. Nothing Buffalo did in that game. Buffalo didn't look all that great on offense. I mean, on defense. They looked okay on offense. Dolphins looked great on defense for the second half. They looked well, putrid on offense in the first half. They looked great on offense in the second half. Well, and that's the miss in the second half. I don't think that has anything to do with how they're going to play going forward. Well, and that's why I'm actually really happy you brought that up because honestly, the two games were so eerily similar Two teams that everyone looked at and goes, hey, we know what the bills are with Josh Allen, even if some of their pieces on offense have changed and even if their approach is going to be different. We know what they are. And at the same time, here's this Dolphins team that a lot of the talking heads are picking as the best team in the AFC East. And both of them have this start that I swear to God, like there's almost 
I'm a big believer that sometimes the, like you just can't learn anything from the tape. <laughs> they play both teams played about as flat of a first half as you possibly can. Mm-hmm. And yet they went into the locker room at halftime, composed themselves. And then kind of showed everybody like, this is what good coaching does for you. This is the advantage when you have not only veteran players, but when you've got the talent in the right spots and you have the right people coordinating it, you can take a game where you fall in completely on your face and turn it on its head. And yeah, you got a hole to dig out of, but everybody knows that you're talented enough to do it. And both teams showcase that in their second halves. And that's how both teams ended up walking away with, nail biter victories <laughs> as they somehow got to one and one yeah the only thing you can discern from from the dolphin game was they revamped the running game into a new style of gap scheme mm-hmm. using a lot of linebackers a lot of heavy packages and that looked clunky and disorganized for the first half <clears throat> and to be honest with you it looked like a team that played a total of five plays with their starting offense all of preseason Okay, so maybe they should have played a half. Yeah, the Bills got the ball. We have this giant, mind you, for all the, I, I brought this up, for all the people who were mad about the referees and the poor officiating, we got away with a brutal hold on a kick return, and our guy takes it out to the 50, and everyone's all fired up. We're like, yeah, it's our first drive. They scored, but we're about to hit them back, and it ends up in that Josh Allen fumble in the red zone, and it's... It was just one of those things of guys. I don't, you all look rusty. Like we got there because we ran the football. This, this, this switch to the run. And it's funny that you say they have more of a running approach because I saw a graph today and I forget who tweeted it out, but they were talking about EPA per play and they were tracking it over the last like 10 years of football. And they showed that if you look at where we stand now and then you look at week one, of 2024 compared to everything else. Now, this will regress to the mean, but his point was, if you look at EPA per play on all plays, passing plays and running plays, and you have three dotted lines on the same graph, passing plays have the EPA per play because passing has become the bread and butter of the NFL has slowly started to become watered down. And so your EPA per play is starting to drop, but the teams that are running the football well do it so well now because everybody's built their defenses with smaller linebackers who don't run defend as well smaller defensive linemen who can get better pass rush that the epa per running play spiked significantly in week one and he was saying how this might be like again there will be some regression to the mean but it's the inevitable trend line of when too many people are doing one thing, eventually the pendulum swings back the other way, and this becomes the way of the league. And so it's not a coincidence that you see teams like Buffalo and teams like Miami investing resources in a running attack, investing resources into building a scheme and figuring out who are going to be your ancillary blockers, not just on the offensive line, but also at wide receiver. We're going to need to build profiles of tight ends and wide receivers who are going to facilitate blocking in space at the second and third level, if possible. And you're watching that suddenly start to power offenses in a way it hasn't in the last four or five years. I'm I'm really interested to see this aspect of the Miami Dolphins. And so as we start, yeah, the- they started the game. They started the game, and re- remember that you know Mike McDaniel is not going to get rid of any of his motions mm-hmm. and. You know, all the intricate plays that they run, they run cross bucks where they have two backs in and one goes one way, the other one goes the other way. And two is doing all of this orchestration and ball handling. In the first half, it really did look like a team that didn't know what the hell they were doing. <laughs> like, it, they look like, okay, what are we doing here? Like, you know, who's in motion now? Who are we blocking? And you had all of this orchestration. The ball would get handed off to Mostert or to A-Chan and nothing would happen. It would be a one or two yard game. Oddly enough, in the fourth quarter, and I just finished charting this stuff and I put it on, on our Discord on OnlyFans for our vetted members. I put the their best runs of the game toward the end of the game. They're all the simplest traps and leads and power plays. And they actually started converting third and ones in this in this game. And they did it in the most old fashioned way possible. 
Mm -hmm. They handed the ball to Alec Ingold, all 245 pounds of them. Dude, fullbacks Um, running the football, it seems like such an archaic thing. But sometimes it's the smartest decision you can make if you've got a giant fullback. Yeah, Dolphins, third and one, twice. They handed the ball to Ingold, he got two yards. They handed it to him again, he got six yards. Uh, Those are first downs. Yep. You know what I mean? So... At the end of the game, they simplified the run game, and except for that holding penalty, they could have really iced the game with like a chippy. Uh, they ended up getting backed up and backed up and backed up, and they ended up hick- having to kick a 52-yarder to win it. But they get simplified things. So I, I think that that's something that you're going to see for this week against Buffalo uh, in our game on Thursday, how Miami takes to all this new orchestration on the run game, because they really did revamp the whole entire thing. Mm-hmm. They went from an, a, a predominantly outside zone scheme, which is very, very simple to run. Okay. Uh, remember all the window dressing, and then it's a very simple run. Like you're mm-hmm. hitting landmarks and you're gone. They changed all of that to a very intricate gap scheme. We'll see what they do on Thursday because they always still have it in their, in their back pocket to go back to their outside zone scheme. But we'll see how far along it, it, it's going to be going into thursday because it really was nowhere in the first half of this game and that was going to be my question so when i look at this and i say to myself all right both the bills and the dolphins were in the same boat one touchdown in the first half of their respective games offense that seems like it was kind of plodding it wasn't as explosive as you would have wanted to see and then you know i'm looking at the drive charts here and i'm just taking a look at how things went like there's the, it seemed that some of what was happening was a byproduct of pressure. Obviously, the Jacksonville Jaguars have committed a lot of assets to their front seven. So I don't know that Buffalo has the tools at its disposal to get the same pass rush that Jacksonville has. They just don't. With that in mind, they, a lot of it can work in the interior offensive line. And I'm interested to know what your thoughts are from what you saw in that first game to how you think that that matches up against Buffalo here with our front seven that operates in a little bit of a different scheme. And obviously the talent level is not the same. Yeah, it was it was a weird evaluation. And I remember I gave it a a once over right away and I posted it on on OnlyFans and I said, look, the tackles were good. Aaron Brewer at center was stellar. He was spectacular. And the guards were bad. I gave it another look again, and I kind of came away with the same feel. Mm-hmm. Although Eichenberg and, and Robert Jones had some nice blocks toward the end of the game when they were simplifying things. I'm going to give them the benefit of the doubt that all this orchestration was screwing them up with all the pulling and and fainting and and double teams that they have to do and all their leads and, and their ISO blocking because it really looked like they were completely out of sorts. I thought our tackles, uh, Teron Armstead and Austin Jackson, were great. Austin Jackson had a highlight play. Uh, um, I don't know if they're showing it on on TV today, but uh, it was one that I posted where he ended up blocking three guys on one run play where <laughs> they gained six yards. And, you know, he's coming on to his own. He has a, a kind of a mean streak. And Aaron Brewer was as advertised. For a guy so small, he actually played pretty powerful, especially on those belly runs with, uh, with Alec Engold. But yeah, the guards are a concern, are a concern. And if you're Buffalo, you got to hang your hat, hang your hat on what you can get up the middle with your defensive tackles against Eichenberg and mm-hmm. Robert Jones. And I guess you're going to have to try to stop the run with that, right? Try to dominate that matchup. And if you dominate that matchup, you're probably going to stop their gap scheme because their gap scheme is built around some power running behind those guys. With see, combo blocks, of course, but still power see, running. That's interesting to me because Dorian Williams, like, say what you want. He showed a lot better in coverage yesterday than I was expecting. But when I think about what he excels at now, being just a second-year player and his first time starting, the only reason he's here is because of what happened to Matt Milano. Otherwise, he would still be riding pine and playing special teams. He's very good against the run. Now, he's been known to take some bad angles, which is why I'm interested to see how he re- reacts to all the eye candy that your offense likes to throw around in regards to some of these running plays. But he's a sound tackler. He comes downhill quickly. He hits. He's he's one of those like authoritative tacklers. And you need that, especially if you're playing a team who's maybe their guard play isn't the best and he can shed and attack and he kind of he's learning how to diagnose. And I think that Terrell Bernard showed last year that he's very good in that regard. 
Like when him and Matt Milano were together, our defense was lights out because they both have the same instinctual. They can visualize what's happening and react to it faster than, you know, almost like they're reacting to the play in real time, but they're in motion. And that's how they find that even though they're not huge, they don't get blocked out of plays a lot because they're just instinctive enough to be ahead of it by a half a second. That's all that matters. So with that in mind, I think this, the middle of our defense against the run is pretty solid. What I'm concerned about is the passing game and how it didn't really materialize until the second half for you guys. What do you think was holding you back? And how do you think knowing the makeup of the Bills cornerbacks and safeties, how do you think that they try to you know, shape this passing attack on Thursday? Well, Mike McDaniel went in the lab. He wasn't only, you know, buying new shoes and changing his look and buying new sunglasses. Yeah, because he did that whole thing about he went, came in a Best Buy employee and now he looks like a Colombian drug lord. He, <laughs> yeah, I, and I love it. I was like, that he, happens to all of us here in Miami. Well, I was okay? going to say, when you live in a place like that and you get a couple million dollars that you've never had before, yeah, I'm yeah. going to start. I'm, I'm you end up stop, looking like him. I'm going to uh, stop taking like my him. sunglasses off inside. Like, that's it. Yeah. That's just what's going to happen. Yeah, he didn't only do that in the off season. He wore, he he brought out some wrinkles. Dolphins have that little pet play. You guys know which one it is. It's the flat wheel and then mm-hmm. the glance route that yep. they run it about three times a game. It's their pet play. Well, they built something into that that little <laughs> thing. And did they un de pants the the Jacksonville Jaguars twice on it? They got them good the first time in the first quarter, and Tua just flat out missed Tyreek. That should have been a 70-yard touchdown. Uh, Tua just missed him. Uh, he was a little bit out of sync. And, like again, like I said, you play five snaps in the preseason. They looked like a team that played five snaps, right? And Tyreek played zero. That's just Tua that played five snaps. And he played five yeah. snaps with three of his five offensive linemen. Mm-hmm. Okay? So, Waddle didn't play at all in the preseason. Neither did Tyreek. John U. Smith played five snaps with Tua. Mm-hmm. Uh, Aaron Brewer didn't play in the preseason. Uh, Armstead never plays in the preseason, never practices either. Austin Jackson just played those five plays as well. Uh, it was a new approach. I think that approach failed. But in the second half, you can see how Tua was just, you know, picking it up. And you saw the numbers. He was 10 of 12 for 200 yards and 140 passer rating in the second half. So he was pretty sharp. And they built that little thing where you have that fat, that flat pass wheel glance route combo, right? And what they did is that they would have Tyreek on the opposite side of the formation and they would run him on the over route. (laughs) And what they would have Tua do is, since it's an RPO, you know, he puts it in the belly of the running back and then pulls it and he looks at the glance route. If it's there, he throws it. If it's not, he throws the wheel or he throws to the flat, right? Mm -hmm. What they had Tua do this time is put it in the belly pull it out, look at the glance route, and instead of looking to the flat and the wheel, he threw the deep over to Tyreek and ADR touchdown is what you saw. Kevin Harlan. You know, it's – Chris, you're a guy who's a nerd about announcers. That I am. Has there been a guy who's done better for the NFL than Kevin Harlan? I think he has some of the best calls. Do you want to hear a stat on Kevin Harlan? What? In games Kevin Harlan calls with the Miami Dolphins, the Miami Dolphins are 8-0. and oh. Wow. This is the latest. There were 7-0 and oh coming into this game. So, Chris, his voice, his inflection, his enthusiasm, like it almost makes a call like that better, doesn't it? It does. You, his best calls have been uh, streakers on because he does the uh, – That is true. He does Westwood One Radio right. for the Super Bowl. And he's come away with some incredible calls for streakers. I'm pretty sure there's a YouTube montage, isn't there? It's got to be. Guys, go go to so someone. Call in if you know. Is there a YouTube montage about Kevin Harlan st- st- calling streakers? <laughs> so when I think about this and how your offense kind of found its footing and really got going against Jacksonville, I turned to the – well, first of all, how worried are you about these potential running back injuries? Because that's kind of a thing that could – I know you guys have a rookie you really like, and I know that you built the depth chart so that it's like, hey, even if a guy's banged up, we still have other guys with top-end speed that we can put in here. But it would be rough if a rookie had to start this game. 
wouldn't you think? And also, what do you think about A-Chan's durability? Like, it has to start to become a legitimate concern for you, right? Well, he he hobbled out of the game a couple of times, and he shows up on the on the injury report. It looks like he's going to be okay. They made Jalen Wright inactive. So, yeah. you know, I, I think that's part of their plan. They finished the game with Jeff Wilson as their power back. They tend to do that in the fourth quarter anyway, especially when they're winning. So it is a concern because he got a heavy workload in this game. You would think, okay, the 10 carries, that's just 10 carries. He got seven balls on 10 targets. So that's 20 attempted touches in the game. That's a a little hefty, in my opinion. It's a lot for a guy who's not very big and who's known to have some durability issues. Why do you think they cranked his workload like that? I think it's what they want to do. Okay. I think that they want to dial down. Okay. They want to dial down uh, Raheem Mostert and they want to up uh, HN's uh, touch count because they want to preserve Raheem Mostert for the end of the season, really. Mm-hmm. Or for you know for games that they're actually going to use them, uh, for you know maybe when they go back more to their zone scheme stuff, if if this gap scheme stuff doesn't take off, you know. Mm-hmm. So, you know, uh, if you don't see Achan, it's obvious who you're going to see. You're going to yeah. see the rookie Jalen Wright. Uh, so you're going to see a little bit bigger guy, but you know a lot of speed and mm-hmm. very similar skill sets. Both good receivers. He's not Devon Achan in my opinion. He's no. more of a, a second moster. Well, that's know? what I was going to say. When you have that size and speed, but the problem is like, because Mostert's always been fast. Mostert's always been big. He's been able to run between the tackles. He's done a lot of things and he's fast. The thing that I would hesitate is putting a rookie into a complicated offense because there's room for issues, communication errors. There's just a lot of variance that you can introduce to things by putting a rookie into a, that scenario. It's early enough in the season. Rookies are going to play. It's going to it's going to happen. Right. So with that in mind, it's just that's going to be a big one for me watching it and how that affects the structure and the approach of the Miami Dolphins offense, because I don't think the approach will change. I just think that between most and it, like if most are hurt, what does that do to your offense? Yeah, if most are hurt, they're just going to elevate guy. Remember, they have they have a, they have mm-hmm. two sets of the same guy. Yep. You know? Oh yeah. So they got Mostert and HN. Those are the guys that they want to play. And by the way, they play them together. Yeah. Like they were together 53% of the snaps in this yep. game. So that's one set. And the second set is Wilson and Wright. Yeah. You know, now when they're healthy, they're only going to activate three. Yep. You know, you know, if one is hurt, they'll activate the other three and one will step in. So they always have them in sets because they play two of them at yep. a time. You know, and really they're, they're kind of, you know, Wright and Mostert are, you know, in the same skill set and A-Chan and Wright are in the other skill set. Although Wright's like a, like a, like you said, he's a different player. He's 215 pounds. What are the so, matchups that you really like from, for Miami in this one on offense? Against Buffalo? Well, it depends if, if A-Chan is available. If yeah. A-Chan's available, I like him against pretty much any of your safeties when we go empty, uh, cause we do put them out wide. So I would look for Tua to be looking at his way, uh, you know, for most of the game, if that's mm-hmm. the way that they're, you know, they're going to play, if he's going to be healthy. Otherwise, our third wide receivers were a mess in this game. Jonu Smith did not get any of his stuff that they, that they put in, in the installs for in the regular season. Cause you can, you could kind of see in the game where, okay, we're down two touchdowns. <laughs> you know, let's stop trying to run all this crap that, that we don't know what the hell we're doing with. Mm-hmm. And let's get back to some of our bread and butter stuff. And sure enough, that turned the game a little bit. Mm-hmm. So I would expect a new reimagining of who's that third wide receiver is going to be because it's been a mess. They revamped the entire back end of the of the wide receiver room. I don't know if you noticed. Uh, we got a, a, a blocking uh, wide receiver in Grant Dubose. Robbie Chosen is back. <laughs> to run his buddy routes. You know, Barrios was terrible in this game. And for whatever reason... Odell Beckham is not ready yet, although he should have been, and he actually wants to, wanted to play. So he'll be back in by week five. It's obvious that they need him because all their 11 personnel stuff, they only ran 21 snaps of 11 personnel, and most of wow. it was win- window dressing just to open up things for Waddle and Tyreek. Okay. 
See, now you that's know? something that's something interesting there. So what you're saying is, is that because of the w- problems you've had on the depth chart, not having Odell Beckham Jr., and just the issues you've had with the consistency of the wide receivers behind him, the three wide receiver looks and four wide receiver stuff, spread stuff, it's being more driven towards tight ends and running backs because they can't find a wide receiver on the depth chart to take that role. Interesting. Yeah, they it it's been a problem because they they have high hopes on this rookie Malik Washington, but he found an injury, and it's apparently uh, an injury that did keep him out of this game, and it's mm-hmm. likely going to keep him out of the the Buffalo Bills game. He has a quadriceps injury. Uh, he was nursing something from that last preseason game because uh, he was taking a lot of snaps. Mm-hmm. Malik Washington's a guy who has some promise, and I think he was a guy that was going to work pretty well in this group especially considering what Berrios has given them which hasn't been much i mean th- th- there's only so much you can hope to get out of a guy like braxton Berrios. you've played for the jets i think that chris was that his only team if you try to I think have about no idea elf where where else has braxton Berrios ever played i think that that's it right like, uh i think it was just the jets right he got yeah, drafted it was by just the jets, jets and then he was uh you know, hey, I'm a free agent signing. I'm a kick returner, but I can also be a gadget wide receiver. And then he's two targets, no catches. And <laughs> everyone's looking, going, wait, what are you doing here? How many routes were you on the field for? So it'll be interesting to see how you guys try to attack us and match up against all of what we have to offer on defense, because they do against the Cardinals in the second half. The Bills kind of found their composure out of their nickel sets. Obviously, losing to Ron Johnson as early as we did changes some things. And it's going to be interesting to see if they can get Cam Lewis up to speed, if he really is just the starting nickel for the foreseeable future. Just based on some things I heard today. Um, Then it's going to be interesting how they deploy the safeties and how willing they are to commit resources to trying to stop the deep pass versus trying to generate pressure, trying to clog up the box so that they're not just getting run on when you guys do decide to clear out. it's It'll be interesting to see that chess match. Now, on the other side of the football, Brian Thomas Jr. had a coming out party against you guys. Yardage wasn't huge, but he catches his nasty touchdown, and he's four for four. Nobody could really cover him. What happened there? Like, what, what what would you say? I mean, was it just that he's such a talent that he couldn't be covered? Or is there something structurally or some mistakes that you saw them making that they corrected in the second half? Uh, in the second half, they, they went to a little bit more simpler coverages and because they really threw the kitchen sink at the at the Jacksonville Jaguars. They ended up with a pretty damn good game, by the way. OK, they got 11 quarterback pressures, four sacks, 267 yards. And I said this before on Twitter. I don't, you know, you can think whatever you want to think about the Jacksonville Jaguars. That's a talented offense. Sure. Okay. You have Brian Thomas Jr. I like Gabe Davis. I've always liked Gabe Davis. I know that that Buffalo Bills fans, some of them didn't like him all that much. I think he's a really good player. As a third wide receiver, that's pretty damn good. Sure. I just didn't like him. See, there's a difference between, hey, I like that player. And then there's, hey, I like that player so much, I'm going to give him $80 million. (laughs) So say, yeah, that's hey, a problem, I don't, right? I don't like you that much. That's a problem, right? But, you know, they roll out Christian Kirk, Gabe Davis, Brian Thomas Jr. They have a $250 million quarterback. They have a really expensive offensive line. They got Travis Etienne. Tank Bigsby is actually a really nice running back. Yes. And Evan Ingram is a really good pass-catching tight end. So they have a lot of talent on 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 offense. They also have Trevor that, Lawrence, though, who I heard is better than Tua Tungvaloa. Right, which is all kinds of (laughs) insane at this point. Watching you you on Twitter just waging war against. Now you got to be smoking crack at this point to even think that they're in the same stratosphere as quarterbacks. Okay, you know I like no. My favorite are the uh, the Jags fans that are saying, "Oh, if you looked at the game, (laughs) he was actually better than Tua in this game." Yeah, how? One guy threw for twice as many yards, won the game. Had a 140 passer rating in one half, while the other one had a 70 passer rating. <laughs> like, come on, man! You know, it is yeah, zero turnover worthy plays. The PFF's favorite thing. Trevor Lawrence had three turnover worthy plays. The whole turnover worthy play thing. Did he? Turn I don't even it know what the hell that means. Well, the funny That's thing is, of it. 
my favorite's that thing where they go, well, that play should have been worth a, a turnover. And I go, yeah, my, my, my quarterback turns it over all the fucking time. Guess what? I don't care. Do you want to know why? Because he also does some crazy shit that nobody else can do. And if yeah. it costs me a couple fumbles and then a bad interception or two, because he's a wild man who's just going to run the ball in three times a game when he feels like he has to, I, you know what? I'll take it. Yeah, Brian Thomas was really, really tough in this game. He was left one on one on one with Jalen Ramsey. Jalen Ramsey got out of position and he flat out interfered with him because he thought he was going to get a touchdown caught on him. Yeah, on a pretty bad ball by Trevor Lawrence, by the way. Trevor <laughs> Lawrence has to throw him away from the contact, but he ended up getting the he ended up getting the penalty because it was a bad pass. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Although he, he might have had a touchdown if he throws him away from you know if he throws him away leverage away from leverage, it's probably a touchdown. So he was really, really good. In the second half, Miami just buckled down, and that pass rush came alive. Jalen Phillips got a sack in his first game back. So got the a pass sack in his first game back had three pressures. Uh, he took over the game in the fourth quarter. If you watch him, I posted some clips on OnlyFans way as well. Every third down, he got a pressure, and then he finally got a sack on the final third down of the game for See? the Jaguars. So all of the people who were talking about, oh, the Miami Dolphins are going to have any pass rush. I and now there's a part of me that as I you know go back and I kind of watch the condensed version of that game and I think to myself I wonder if this is why Shaq Barrett retired because he kind of saw hey Jalen Phillips is actually going to be ready to go and some of these other guys are going to be ready to go and I just don't care that much and I don't think I'm going to be able to play my way into playing time in which case what am I doing here I could be with my family (laughs) <laughs> he just said, hey, yeah. if I'm going to be a healthy scratch slash a backup candidate, I'll just go home and be with my kids. <laughs> yeah, as of right now, I think it's overkill, but that's fine because last year Stigmata hit the team at the edge positions. Mm-hmm. But look at the guys that they played yesterday. They made Mo Kamara inactive yesterday. They played a bunch of them on the edge. Agba got a sack. He played some on the edge. Mm-hmm. Even Calais Campbell played some on the edge. Had a sack too. Uh, he got a he got yesterday. He got arrested and got a sack, which is <laughs> which is all kinds of awesome. So, so yeah. when it comes to this matchup with the Buffalo Bills, we talk about the con- con- constitution of your defense. We know you have a Jalen Ramsey, and the value of that seems to be like. You know, the one thing that your Vic Fangio never wanted to do last year, which is to let your best cornerbacks travel with the other team's number one wide receiver. And we just said, okay, fine, we'll move digs anywhere. We'll put guys, Khalil Shakir, we'll move these guys around to where they're not going to be impacted by that guy. Now it seems like he's got a little bit more leeway. You guys kind of move him around, do more stuff with him. The problem is Buffalo put on like put on tape. The idea that even when we don't use our best skill players, we are going to spread the ball, legitimately spread it like peanut butter. It's every what 10 different players caught a pass and nine of them caught a first down pass. That's nuts. That that's almost saying, hey, our scheme is not dependent on the talent of one individual guy. It's a scheme. And so in a single week, having never played this version of the Buffalo Bills before, when you look at what you get beyond Jalen Ramsey, when you start going down the depth chart at cornerback and defensive back, what are some of the things you're worried about when it comes to trying to match up with all the different size and skill types the Bills wide receivers have? I mean, I saw Jordan Poyer gave up that. He's the one who got that touchdown by Brian, Brian Thompson Jr. caught on him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he gave it up on on quarters coverage. He dropped an interception, by the way. Yes, that was that would have brought the house down because it was on that first sequence where essentially every new player on the team was making a play. The first play of the game, Calais Campbell gets a sack. The second player of the game, the second play of the game, uh, Jordan Brooks got a, a tackle for a loss. And the third play of the game, Jordan Porter would have had an interception, but he flat out dropped it. But he dropped it because he has a cast in his hand. And we'll. But, but so the cast on his hand, nobody here hates Jordan Boyer. We love that guy. He will go down as being one of the toughest son of a bitches to ever wear our uniform. I mean, the dude rented a bus and drove to Kansas City and played. And yesterday, I don't know if you saw the play, but he got his finger, his uh, cast stuck in the helmet of Travis Etienne <laughs> on, a, on a play. I don't know if you saw it. No. It, uh, it was one of those where you can't argue I wasn't, you know, I didn't hold him by the face mask. 
Yeah, I don't have any that, fingers, right? I've got a club. Yeah, because because you see that they, they run a toss play, and the force player is Jordan Poirier. So he's the one who's responsible for yep. the toss play. And Jordan Poirier makes the tackle for a loss, but the flags come flying, right? And next thing you know, there's a heap of players. And you see that Jordan Poirier is just like, he has his fingers inside of the face mask of Travis Etienne. But he can't get it out. He can't get it out. And Travis Etienne takes <laughs> off his helmet. And you see Jordan Poirier is waving around the, the helmet. <laughs> it's one of those where like, yeah, okay, yeah. You, you know, here's the 15 yards. All right, I'm not going to argue it. Yeah. Right? You know? But yeah, uh, you know, playing with a cast in your hand. So I wouldn't expect Jordan Poirier to get an interception. His in brain, game, unless he, you could catch it with his left hand. He, I think that that's the thing is he's reached a point where he's an old safety who's a little brittle because he's just uh, sustained such a just a physical brand of football for a really long time. And you're starting to see some of that. And in coverage, I think you kind of like if I were to look at this and just say, OK, let's take a look at the grades and who gave up what. When you look at it, Jordan Poyer, I mean, it wasn't terrible, but those 23 yards were all. <laughs> they were all Brian Thomas Jr. And it's just that play where you wish he was a little bit faster. And that was us last year watching him play going, damn it. If you were just a little bit faster, you would have. This, these are vintage Jordan Poyer turnovers, vintage Jordan Poyer coming down in the box and laying a big hit on somebody. But he's just a step too slow. Yeah. And, on that play, on that play, it was obvious too. it's quarters. And you see that. Because that's also, you know, Jags fans that don't know ball. Oh, he caught that on Jalen Ramsey. No, that's Jalen Ramsey running across the field to cover for Jordan Poyer. Yeah, yeah exactly. <laughs> in quarters coverage, all right? Because if you notice, Jalen Ramsey's desperately trying to get into the play. That's because he sees that Brian Thomas has crossed the face of Jordan Poyer. Yeah. Like that's it. You have to get as deep as possible. You got to take away that route. And it was a good throw, perfectly layered throw into the back of the end zone. But, uh, yeah, uh, you know, they simplified things toward the end. They started playing a lot more dime, and they, got, they saw some success. And they let the, the pass rush go with, uh, with four. And I was wrong about Anthony Weaver because I thought that he would have a niche trigger finger as far as sending blitzes, but he really didn't do that. He trusted his – which is strange, I thought, because Trevor Lawrence is a guy who doesn't do well under duress, especially, uh, you know, blitz. So they sent some blitzes. But in the second half, they pretty much got it done with four guys. You know? So who are the so if the Bills were to make hay with their passing attack against your secondary, given that they're deep, right? The, 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 the talent level might not be high, but they're deep and they can spread the field. And you saw that in that second, that third quarter against Arizona was just it was a bloodletting because nobody could stop the fact that, hey, we're going to get into second long and then I have five different targets I can go to and I'm comfortable with all of them. What worries you about the depth chart as you get past Jalen Ramsey and you start going down? Like, who are some of the liabilities for the Dolphins in this matchup, you think? Uh, well, we didn't really get to see Storm Duck get tested. They did a very odd thing. Ethan Bonner. First of all, can we tried. laugh that Storm Duck is a real name? It's a real name of a guy who's wearing an NFL jersey. And a real player, by the way. He made a hell of a play yesterday on a on a tackle for loss. Uh, physical player. He's strong. Well, yeah, you have to be tough. Your name is fucking Storm. It's a boy named Sue. If you na if you get named Storm Duck, you better be able to fight everybody in the room in any given moment. <laughs> but they did a very odd thing. All training camp, we were led to believe that Ethan Bonner was ahead in the pecking order, right? Mm -hmm. That he was cornerback four. All of a sudden, he's inactive for game day. Now. Besides the obvious, which is that he's a white cornerback. <laughs> yeah. And his name is he Ethan. He does run 429. Okay. Okay. But also, and his name is Ethan. And if, uh, if, uh, what's his face? Chris, the, uh, comedian. Oh my God. Why am I blanking on this? George Carlin. Soft names make soft people. I don't want a cornerback named Ethan. <laughs> so we were led to believe that he was going to be higher in the pecking order. Obviously, you know, Cam Smith is out. So you thought, okay, he would get the call up. No, Storm Duck got the call up on the defense. And they're playing Cater Kohu as a nickel. They still have Nick Needham, who they could elevate, depending on what happens this week. Uh, Fuller plays exclusively outside. If there's a weak spot on on that secondary, it's whenever you get them to scramble up their, their coverages on empty and Ramsey reduces inside, and you could isolate Cater Kohu outside. But we knew that before. Like, yeah. you know, 
Kader Kohu's best, you know, Kader Kohu's at his best in, when he's in short areas playing physical. Because that's what he is. He's a physical type. He's more of a Teron Johnson, really. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? <clears throat> he's no. a poor man's Teron Johnson. To- totally understandable. And so, that, so, so that's interesting to me. And then I just think about the approach of the pass rush and your defensive coordinator. And by the way, the, the Jaguars did get to him a couple of times by putting him outside. And they caught a couple of balls on him, too. See? the the This is his first rodeo with Josh Allen. And as every Dolphins fan out there knows, tangling with Josh Allen is a bitch. It's just a bitch because as a defensive coordinator, you have to try to say, okay, he's got multiple targets. He can throw the ball to. I want my secondary doing X, Y, and Z. We have to have a zone here, but I want, or it's like, Hey, we have to press the line, play a little bit of man on the outside on this down. We're going to try to manufacture pass rush this way because it's second. And we think a passing down, but also if that doesn't land, this guy is going to take off. And he's going to do some ugly things to my defense. Do you think Anthony Weaver is prepared for his first interaction with Josh Allen? Well, he's been given a lot of weapons and he's been a lot of the weapons. I've never been a guy that, oh, that, that ever advocated for, you know, you remember for a thousand years, everybody was saying, oh, you got to draft for the New England Patriots. You got to draft to beat the Patriots, right? Mm-hmm. I never believed in that. I think you draft to try to win as many games as possible so you could get into the playoffs. Okay. That's my philosophy. I don't think you draft to beat one team. I, th- I Personally, I think that they revamped the defense to beat Josh Allen because they decided that their linebackers were slow. They improved the speed on the linebacking core. They decided that their cornerbacks weren't any good, and they added three new ones. <laughs> they thought that their safeties weren't good, and they added two new ones. So, you know, including one who's going to probably play in that spy role in Jordan Poyer this weekend because that's something that he was doing toward the end of the game. Although Trevor Lawrence never took off. So, you know, they've changed the personnel. So we shall see if it pays dividends uh, this Thursday. Because it should be fun. Because uh, I think that the, the Bills proved, at least in this game, that they're pretty much going to be the same team that they were down the stretch last year. A power running team that's going to rely on Josh Allen when the shit hits the fan, you know. Mm-hmm. Which it hits at, at, at certain times, you know. I don't know how you experienced that game, by the way, with Kyler Murray. I know you got to him a couple of times, but I thought he was overwhelming as I watched that game. I thought Kyler Murray was really good in that. Kyler game. Murray was incredibly athletic, and he kept them alive. I will say watching Greg Rousseau just, like, I was disappointed in the way our defensive line played against guys who shouldn't even be in the NFL, some of them, on the interior offensive line. But watching him handle those tackles was impressive. I mean, he had a m- three sacks, three tackles for loss, six solo run stops, <laughs> like, de- forced force fumble. He was everywhere. He was it. He was my hero of the week. So two and a half point spread. What's your prediction? What do you got for this one? Well, I think that this this sets up for Miami. It's a short week. Uh, the Bills have to travel here. Uh, the moon's going to be really hot. It's supposed <laughs> to be 91 degrees. So, you know, put on your sunblock. That moon's going to burn you up, uh, Bill's fans. <laughs> so, you know, you I think Miami Miami actually produced the kind of game you that I keep talking about them producing, which is the ugly win. Because when you have an ugly win, you got plenty of things to worry about and plenty of things to work on. And Tua, at the end of the game, actually put it best when he said, we went out there for a, for a half of football with our head up our ass. And and they took it to us. So I would expect them to clean up some of the stuff in the running game. And I think they should be effective. I don't think it's a I don't think Miami runs away with this by any stretch of the imagination. It should be a nail biter again. Uh, and I think that this is going to be a pretty good game. I think the the Bills, you know, their demise was grossly exaggerated, in my opinion. I thought that that Cardinal team was primed to play a good game in that first game. I even I told people that you know so you know i don't i don't put i you know in fact had they beaten the bills it wouldn't have been one of those situations where like ah you see the bills suck you know no it doesn't work that way i thought the cardinals played a pretty good game and i think they're they're a team that's going to hang around eight wins this season and they could win nine if they win nine it wouldn't surprise me in the least bit so this is going to be a close game so 
You know, I don't think there's going to be a million points scored in this game. Something in the low 20s with the winner at 23-20. I'll call Miami 23-20, and Jason Sanders makes it 9 for 9 with winning kicks. To your point, Elf, I'm going to tell you, the Bills yesterday tied the NFL record for the most games having not lo- like it's the most games having like having never lost by more than a score 41 straight games they have never lost by more than six points yeah i know and so now we're all in here and it's like what are the odds like you have all of that history and you go what are the odds we're gonna blow these guys out it's probably not great <laughs> this is well miami miami's best game is capable of blowing out the the 85 bears right sure the thing is that when are you going to get to that best game? Exactly. You know? And well, you're probably not going to get to it in week two on a no. Thursday night on a short week, you know, when you're still trying to install a running game, you know, 100%. and we still really don't know what you have inside. You know, you have Isaiah Wynn coming back in, in a few weeks. And when he comes back, maybe he takes one of the spots inside. So that it's pretty unsettled. You know, you have a center, you know, you have two tackles and you know, you have to revamp this running game because it wasn't it in that first game. You ended up, you ended up relying right back to the three amigos, Tua, Tyreek, and Waddle. You know, <laughs> so we shall see if they expand the offense. God knows they have to because, you know, they didn't get much from any wide receiver not named Tua. I mean, not named Waddle and Tyreek, and the running game was really non-existent for an entire almost three quarters non non-existent. It'll be interesting to see if our defense has the chops for it. Elf, I love the fact that you join us for this stuff all the time. Where can everybody follow you on Twitter and where can we find you on social media? Or at least well, where can wanna, we find you your Discord? To, yeah, if you want to listen to our podcast, and we do a preview show uh, every day, a, a day before the game every single week. So we'll do ours for the Bills game on Wednesday. Uh, if you want to listen to our podcast, it's three yards per carry. That's the number three yards per carry. Anywhere you get your podcast, you want to follow us on Twitter, it's at three yards per carry also the number three yards per carry and of course if you want to become a member of our discord and scream at us uh you <laughs> After go to this one eg forward slash only things and you become a member there for three dollars a month alf artiaga three yards per carry he's got a discord you can find his podcast wherever you get your podcasts and so chris that brings us to tonight's keys to victory wow it's a lot of keys bigger the keychain, more powerful the man There are a handful of things I think the Buffalo Bills have to do in order to get the win in this one. And one of them is, Chris, this is rough, right? When I say this, it's going to come across as insensitive to every Bills fan everywhere. They need to, and I I say this with, with as much respect, right, and reverence for the man as I can. What they need to do is they need to get on Jordan Poyer and tax that ass. Chris, this is going to be one of those moments, right? Like, if you want to win this football game, what you're going to have to do is you're going to have to do the thing. It's the Shawn Michaels giving the giving the sweet chin music to uh, Ric Flair. Yes. It's the I'm sorry. I hate to do this to you. Also, I have to put you down. You saw what he was in coverage against Brian Thomas Jr. last week. Yeah. Not good. Last week. I say that because I'm so used to saying it in podcast form. It was literally yesterday. We watched him botch this and just get blown off the blocks by a guy who was just too big and too physical down the field for him to keep pace with. And then he just gives up this touchdown over his back as other defenders have to chip in and try to help out with his responsibility. That's who he is now as a cover man. And then, you know, Elf kind of flirted with this earlier where he was like, oh, well, when they started putting a spy in the box, they used Jordan Poyer. I think that's a mistake born of the fact that you know Jordan Poyer's reputation. You just don't know what he is and who he is right now in this moment. What I'm going to say to you is that I believe for the Bills to win this game, because, Chris, they played Jordan Poyer every single defensive snap. 
They see him as a starter. I know he's not. I know he is a weak link. You want to talk about how great your secondary is, my pass rush, everything's great, my linebackers are cool. Okay. Give me Jordan Poyer. I will sacrifice that guy to the football gods in this one. When What do you think is going to happen when he meets Josh Allen in the open field? Jesus, I bet he's going to, Josh Allen's just going to run around him and wave bye-bye at him. I could see that happening. Or he just plows into him. I could see this being the sweet chin music where it's like, look, Poyer, you don't want this. I don't want this. But I'm going to make you make a business decision. Why? Because I'm a 29-year-old quarterback and who's a moose, and you're a brittle old man at the end of the road. It sounds insensitive, but one of my keys to the game is they have got to over and over and over again find ways to get on Jordan Poyer. <sighs> that was hard because I hate I hate trying to speak it into existence. Yes. But you know I'm right. Yes. Also, something Elf touched on. You got to win the middle of the field. In the rushing attack, and who, you know, just in terms of what team, offense versus defense and vice versa, can own between the hashes, that team's going to win the football game. Our guards did not have a good game last week, and neither did the Dolphins. But I know that our guards are capable of good games. I know that they are capable of good, solid play. And so with that in mind, I'd like to believe that if one team, especially with Ray Davis, who showed a little bit as a pass catcher on Sunday, and also just Cook making some of the open field runs that he did, some of the runs up the gut where he just knew how to follow his blockers and turned a handoff into nine, 11, 12 yard runs. Whoever wins that facet of this football game is going to have a monster leg up because they're not they're not going to need creativity or at least complicated passing attack. It's going to be, hey, we both want to try to come in here and muscle. I think we're better equipped to do it. I also think that up the middle, we are better defensively than they are. I know they love their linebackers, you know, Jordan Brooks, David Long, both of them free agents that they signed over the last two years. They're doing a good job. They are good linebackers. I think we have good linebackers. And I think we have decent safeties. Now, how preoccupied those safeties are going to get with those wide receivers is going to be interesting. And that's why I think that those those five guys, right, the rotational D tackles and those two inside linebackers are going to have their hands full. And if they can win against that Miami offensive line and rushing attack, and if we can return the favor, I think that's your game right there, Chris. I'll take it. And then the last one is about the pass rush. Everyone wants to, myself included, give Groot this giant, you know, Greg Rousseau, amazing, a savant performance. And then you look back and you go, well, he was playing some really suspect offensive linemen. <laughs> Like, I'm shocked nobody else on the D-line made an impact like that because these guys were kind of dirtbags. What I'm – I guess what I'm looking for here, I need Greg Rousseau to go up against Teron Armstead and Austin Jackson and show that he can still perform at that level when the competition gets kicked up a notch. And these are guys who actually should be tackles in the NFL. I want to see him continue that production. He can't die on the vine for us. Because I'll tell you what, Von Miller, he did make a good play. You know, when I was in the stands, I was talking smack. Went home, rewatched the game. Von Miller was making an impact. But Rousseau is the alpha defensive end on this team. And now, unfortunately, we're going to need him to be. Like, I don't see anybody else stepping up. Chris, who's better than Rousseau right now at the end? He's one of the best. He's it. He he is our alpha in the locker room. And so in that way, we need him to step up and answer the bell. We need him to move to in the pocket so that he's not comfortable standing still, even for the three seconds that these timing routes take, that he knows, hey, wherever that guy is, I have to be aware of where he is. And if he lines up inside over guard on passing downs, 
I think there's a real wrinkle that you can throw at these Miami Dolphins and offset a lot of what they do well. By bringing guys with size up the middle on the pass rush, Epinesa, Rousseau, you can get on those guards and you can win and you can move to off his spot, which already has destroyed their timing-based offense. It's the thing that McDermott has historically done well against the Dolphins, and it's why our record has been so good against them. He knows how to disrupt. Well, now it's in the hands of Bobby Babbage. This is his first engagement with this iteration of the Miami Dolphins. Hopefully, Babbage understands, that, and I'm sure McDermott's put him through the ringer this week, about this is how we've been able to have success. Move to him. Make him think. Make him hold. Make him process. If it's just timing routes, and he can get away, as Elf said earlier, when they, hey, we built this weird hitch in where he fake pumps and then just throws the over. And it's a gimme every time. And he can get the ball out in still under three seconds because it's automatic and just muscle memory. He's comfortable standing there doing that fake pump. You have to make him uncomfortable. And if you can, it's going to be a long day because I don't, Chris, know that our safeties are that great. I just know they didn't get tested a lot. I don't know. Do we expect to see a a Cole Bishop make an appearance this week? I mean, he's not on the injury report. Yeah. So now, what's your prediction for the game? I can't in a good conscience pick Miami to win the game. Nope. And I was successful putting in a new wax ring on a toilet today. <laughs> so I can't go against my Buffalo Bills. I I think they're going to win the game, and I don't think it's going to be – I think last year when they had like that high-scoring game, I was like, nah, it's going to be take the under and the over hit by like halftime. <laughs> I think it's going to be, because it's week two, it's still a feeling out process for the season. I think it's going to be 23-20, Bass comes through. Oh, and he better. He better, because, I mean, if he continues the season how he ended last year with that kick against the Chiefs, he might turn into a brand new Blair Walsh. (laughs) That's a pull. I'll tell you what, I like where your head's at, and you just touched on something. Tyler Bass, like the guy ended last year so poorly. We know what a cerebral position kicking is. At the same time, he did well enough right up until he kicked that kickoff out of bounds at the end of that game. Yes. (laughs) Right up until that, he was having a fine game. He's fine, but I feel like most Bills fans are just sitting here waiting for the other shoe to drop, right? Yeah, yeah. This is going to be an interesting thing to see how he performs in a game like this. And you remember a couple of these have come down to like, does Bass have this? That game in the snow where they were like, hey, we just trust you to make this with no time on the clock to win the game. It's almost like the way they let him take that field goal when they could have gone for it at the end of the Arizona game was like a thing of them saying, hey, let's give him a high pressure, but not, hey, games on the line situation and see how he responds. Yeah, I think it's going to come down on uh, Thursday night. It's going to be a a 40 plus yard field goal for the win. All right. I think the Bills beat the spread. I think we win by more than three. I think it's a... uh, I'm going to say it's a it's a touchdown game, maybe a f- four or five point win. But I think it's also the type of game where if I'm Miami, you know, you can't lose to Buffalo at home again. No. So you're going to start going for two point conversions. You're going to make so So that score is going to get weird. Yeah. Plus for Buffalo, we got we're going to have a run <laughs> here we go, at Miami at H- was it at Baltimore at Houston. Yep. Those are our next three games like. No, we have the Titans in there. No, Titans are in October. Next three games are, well, Jacksonville. You yeah. got, uh, was it Jacksonville's yep. week three? And then I think Baltimore, then Houston. Yeah. So, and we, we're never good against Jacksonville, although we'll wait till next week to get into that. <laughs> and it is funny that the Dolphins employ Jason Sanders and the Bills employ Tyler Bass. And they're two of the most unreliable, but sort of reliable kickers, like kickers you want to be able to rely on. You just always feel 
like dirty doing it. It's going to be great to watch this one play out. I'm happy we're getting it out of the way now. So we this is this is the the first acid test of who is who's where in the pecking order of the AFC East. I love it. I can't wait to watch it play out, but for tonight, we're going to get the hell out of here. I'm Drew Gear. That's Chris Krueger. This has been your Rock Pile Report.